Hi. So I'm Loic. Uh, we met briefly yesterday. Uh, I work at the World Food Program. I've been a core developer of Django since 2014. Uh, and uh, you may know me for my work on uh, forms and the ORM. Or maybe for breaking your project with some backward incompatible changes. So two days ago, I was talking with Matthias, uh, who's the uh, author of Faint CMS. And he was complaining about uh, the most painful backwards uh, incompatibility in Django over the years. And every single one of them was mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I apologize for that. Um, I think it was for the greater good, but you know, what do I know? Anyway, today we are going to be talking about validation. So what are the main concerns uh, when it comes to validation? First, I would say enforcement. Uh, how can you ensure that your validation logic actually runs? Then comes user experience. How do you provide good, fe uh, good feedback to your users about what went wrong? Performance. Ensuring that the validation logic isn't wasteful uh, and that it can handle the expected caseload. And finally, convenience. Uh, is your validation logic easy to audit? Is it easy to change? Uh, does it incur duplications uh, all over the place that need to be kept in sync? So while some of those concerns go well together, uh, others are really at odds. For example, enforcement goes well with user experience. Uh, most users don't want to break your uh, business logic uh, and need, to, uh, need issues to be brought to their attention. Also, if the, the system led through invalid data, it's almost guaranteed that it will start to behave in unpredictable ways, uh, which ultimately leads to poor user experience. However, user experience and performance, those are often conflicting. Um, for example, the database already enforces uh, all the uniqueness constraints. Um, so a model form or a model serializer from DRF uh, could just try to save the object and let the database do its job. Except that Django doesn't quite understand database errors. Uh, so the user feedback would essentially amount to something went wrong. Uh, so instead of that, Django will perform one database query for each uniqueness constraint uh, for the sole purpose of providing good user feedback for something that the database already does. And by the way, this introduced a uh, race condition, because while Django is busy doing all those uh, queries, uh, the database may change, and when you try to save the object, you would get a uh, an integrity error. User experience and developer convenience, uh, those are on the opposite end of the spectrum. So in this day and age, uh, people expect native apps and great user experiences, and that means that you may have to write your validation logic multiple times over and in multiple languages. And since you cannot trust anything coming from the front end, then you have to do that all over again on your Django backend. And maybe for good measure, you should also have it in the database. So this actually brings the question, where should you validate data in a Django project? So first on the front end. This can be ad hoc JavaScript functions or through a framework like Angular. Uh, HTML5 can actually enforce most of the basic validation uh, that is declared on Django fields, uh, presents validation with the required attribute, type validation by uh, using the relevant input type, um, bounds validation with min and max. Uh, you can even validate against a regex with the pattern attribute. Out of the box, Django uh, supports some of these, uh, but it's pretty easy to uh, customize the HTML uh, output uh, using widget. Sadly, the UX uh, provided by the browser uh, is not always great uh, when it comes to HTML validation, uh, but a framework like Angular Material will be able to pick up those clues and provide a decent experience. And then, of course, with native apps, um, most uh, native framework uh, offer decent APIs, at least for the uh, basic validation. So the upside of front-end validation is that it's great for the user experience. Uh, it provides immediate feedback uh, as the user goes, uh, instead of all at once, once a form is submitted. Uh, and of course, it's faster, because it doesn't require a round trip to the server. It may work offline, uh, which is great in many scenarios. But the downside is that it needs to be duplicated on the server side uh, for obvious security reasons. Next up is Django View. So it's not the most elegant way of doing validation, uh, but it ticks most of the boxes. 
Uh, it's on the server side. It has access to the requests, to the session, to the models, uh, and it provides feedback by rendering. It can provide feedback by rendering a template or returning an HTTP error. The downside is that it's easy to circumvent, and we'll see why in a minute. So next up is forms and DRF serializers. Um, those are the designated tool uh, for handling and validating user submissions. They have dedicated APIs uh, to describe and validate data and to handle errors. But just like the views, they're very easy to circumvent accidentally. Uh, take this example. Uh, you have a model form. You're very confident about your validation logic. Um, you have excellent test coverage for it. But then a few weeks later, one of your colleagues uh, add a model admin for it. Uh, and it's quick and easy, just three lines of code, and then all your validation logic is by bypassed. So of course you could use a custom form uh, in the admin, but more often than not, uh, that's not going to happen because it's just too easy not to do it. And same story with direct model queries, uh, or you know, in the Django shell, or in the script. This is actually a cardinal rule of Django. All validation logic that lives on a form, on a serializer, or in a view, uh, will be completely bypassed at one point or another. So serializer, to be fair, uh, do a little bit better than forms. Uh, because you could consider using them in place of manipulating the model directly. Uh, but this requires a change of habit and discipline within the team. There is also an admin renderer, so you can still wrap up a quick admin interface uh, without bypassing the serializer. But then you lose the Django admin, which is more fully featured. Also, unless you completely give up the Django admin, uh, it's going to be horrible user experience to have two different admin interfaces depending on the models. And now the model, uh, which is an interesting place for validation. It's designed for the task. However, it doesn't run by default, uh, because Django didn't get model validation until the 1.2 release. Um, frameworks such as Rails went the opposite uh, direction. So it's only called by model form. Django REST framework purposely ignores it uh, in uh, model serializer, uh, on the premise that it's more auditable to have all the validation in one place. And even with a model form, as we'll see later, uh, it only runs partially uh, on the fields that are exposed by the form. Now, if you want it, it's pretty easy to enforce it by calling full clean in the model save method. So you could also do it with a pre-save signals, but signals are evil. <laughs> uh, so now that we are calling the save method, uh, we are calling it in the save method, uh, it's, it's much harder to circumvent. But unfortunately, it's still not guaranteed to run. Um, query set.update uh, is an obvious culprit, but there are less obvious ones. For example, if you need to load uh, a million records uh, in the database and you don't have the whole day to do it, uh, you should use bulk create. But then your custom save method is not going to run. Same with uh, the fake ORM in uh, run Python, in migrations. Uh, that will ignore your custom save method. And of course, there's always a risk of the DBA running queries behind your back. So another downside is that it's not always available. Uh, if you don't control the model, uh, for example, when you live in a third-party app, when they live in a third-party app, um, you simply cannot customize their validation. Um, unless you're into monkey patching, but yeah, if you like to live dangerously, you might as well do with that validation. So another downside, uh, most of the time, is redundant. Um, a lot of the validation will already happen uh, on the form, and you'll be running, running it again. And if you use a model form or a model serializer, uh, even this expensive, uh, unique validation uh, is going to run again, uh, and that will double your number of database queries. Also, the database enforces uh, a lot of that validation, so that's yet another level of redundancy. And finally, it breaks expectations. Um, because Django doesn't run it by default, more third-party libraries don't expect the safe method to throw validation errors, and therefore they don't handle it. Now, the database. So it's designed for the task, and it's always enforced. So validation rules set in the database are carved in stone. So the whole situation with admin or ad hoc queries by passing your validation, that, that's a thing of the past. And it's also very performant. For example, let's take this simple model. It's an article that blows up uh, when the title is boom. Uh, 
If we loop a million times over to create model instances uh, and call the Fulkin method, on my laptop this takes about seven minutes. By the way, if you don't do that within a transaction atomic block, that's going to take much, much longer. Now with bulk create, uh, moving the validation logic to the database with a constraint, this takes about 45 seconds. Uh, so it's faster by almost one order of magnitude. Now the negatives. Um, it's going to be backend specific. So the ORM gives you some database agnostic validation, like type enforcement, uh, unique, unique together. Uh, and soon you should even be able to do simple check constraints uh, in a somewhat portable way, uh, thanks to the class-based indexes that landed in Django 1.11 and expressions from Django 1.9. Um, so, for example, we could implement something like this. That would generate the SQL from the previous example. But anything more uh, advanced, like custom function or PL SQL or triggers, uh, that's going to be backend specific. It's also harder to write. Um, a lot of people use the ORM because they don't want to deal with SQL, and it's harder to audit. Because it's likely to live in a migration, it's completely out of sight, especially as migration are mostly historical data that you don't generally need to care about. So at the very least, if you have these kind of migrations, uh, you should reference them with a comment uh, in your models.py. And it's obviously much harder to maintain. Because it's stored in the database, uh, so it's a state that needs to be managed and migrated. So those are pretty much all the places where it's reasonable enough to perform some validation. Of course, there are other places, like salary task, migrations, management command, where you may need to enforce your validation logic, uh, but those shouldn't be where you implement them. Uh, they should trigger validation implemented either on a form, uh, on a model, or on a serializer. All right, now we're going to focus on the uh, validation APIs provided by Django. And we start with fields. Fields are the cornerstone of validation in Django and that describe the data in a declarative way and contain most of the validation logic. So that logic is uh, almost identical among uh, fields uh, from forms, models, and serializers, uh, with only some small differences that I will point out as I go along. The first thing, and arguably the most important thing about a field, is its type. Each type has a corresponding data type uh, for which it implements the validation logic. The actual type validation uh, is performed by a method called toPython uh, that is called during the cleaning cycle. Now, let's see the uh, validation uh, commonly found in, uh, in the field definition. There is presence validation. Uh, there is a small inconsisten inconsistency between forms that use uh, a Boolean called required uh, and models that use blank, uh, which work reverse to required. But for their purpose, they're essentially the same thing. There is also bounds validation, um, min length, max length on a text field, uh, min value, max value on a numeric field. There is choice validation. Uh, form and serializers have uh, dedicated choice fields. Uh, models have that implemented in the base field, but it's pretty much the same. Format validations. Um, some fields like regex field or date field have explicit format validation. Others like slug field or email field have implied format validation. And then, of course, for models, uh, there is uniqueness validation. So then come validators. Uh, a field can have some predefined validators uh, declared with the default validators uh, attribute. And it also accepts user-defined validators pass as argument to the constructor. It's worth noting that default validators is poorly named, and it should have been called required validators, uh, because there is no way to opt out of these. DRF made default validators uh, truly behave as default um, at the expense of consistency with Django. So if you supply the validators argument of a serializer field, uh, its built-in validators will be ignored. Uh, a validator is a callable. Uh, it takes in a value and is expected to raise a validation error when it's not valid. And in its simplest form, it's, it's just going to be a function. 
um, for example, this validate event validator. However, at times, you will want to parameterize your validators. And in that case, you can do so with a class-based validator, uh, using the underscore underscore call method. For instance, this multiple validator that takes in a base parameter. If you intend to use that validator on a model field, uh, you need to ensure that it can be deconstructed by migrations. Uh, and that involves two steps. The first one is to add deconstructable, uh, the class decorator, and ensure that two classes instantiated with the same parameters are equal to each other, which is actually something that we could have implemented in uh, deconstructable. I don't know why we didn't do it. If you happen to be allergic to classes, uh, you can use functools.partial, and you can achieve the same thing. And because migration knows how to, how to handle uh, partials um, out of the box, uh, you don't need to do anything special. And that's actually a technique that we might want to document. Once you're done enabling all the validation features of your field, uh, you might be interested in customizing the error messages. And you can do that with the error messages argument. A field can declare uh, a dictionary called default error messages. And the init method uh, loops through all the base classes of that field uh, in reverse order to collect all those error messages. And then it applies the user-supplied uh, uh, error messages given as argument. So for example, any class, any subclass of field uh, would have this uh, required um, error message, plus any new one that it defines, and all of them uh, could be over overridden by the one given by the user. So now that we've declared a field, uh, we can trigger its uh, validation cycle, which is done by calling the field's clean method. A Django REST framework serializer calls this method run validation, uh, but it's essentially the same thing. It starts by calling to Python, uh, which is responsible to enforce the data type uh, and performing any required conversion. Then it calls validate, which performs the presence validation by default, uh, plus any validation that's specific to the field. And finally, it calls run validators, uh, passing the value as argument. Run validators loop through every member of uh, self.validators, calling them with a value as argument, and collecting all the resulting errors uh, in an array to raise them more, all at once at the end. And here is where the error messages uh, dictionary kicks in by overriding the exceptions message uh, if it finds an error code that is matching. Now, as a field author, uh, why would you implement validate instead of specifying a default validator? And that's because uh, validators don't have access to the field instance. Uh, so anything that was given to the field constructor, like required or max length, that cannot be enforced through a default validator. What can be done, though, is dynamically adding new validators to the field constructor. So the upside of validator is that it's reusable. So Django does that for most of its fields. Uh, so that the logic can be shared uh, among models and forms. But if you don't need that reusability, uh, validate is more straightforward and it's less verbose. Now let's talk about the other primitive that is central to uh, Django validation, and that's the validation error class. Take three arguments, message, code, and params. The message can be a simple error, a list of error, or a dictionary that maps field names to list of errors. That last example is how errors uh, flow from the model layer to the form layers in, in case of uh, model form. So an error can be a simple string uh, or an instance of validation error that represents a single error. And when I say the list or dictionary of error, it can be an actual list or dict, or it can be an instance of validation error that represents a list or mapping of errors. So it's unlikely that you will want to declare multiple errors at once, like in this example, uh, but instead you would build a list or a dictionary in a loop, then wrap the result in a validation error, and raise that. 
And we've seen that earlier in the implementation of uh, run validators. So now let's see how this is implemented. So as you can see, the init manages either an internal dictionary called error dict, or a list called error list, or the attribute relevant to a single error, so message, code, and params. With the additional catch that a single error doubles as a list that contains itself. Now let's see how validation errors are commonly raised. So this has a number of issues. Uh, it's got no semantic meaning, so there's nothing clever that you can do with it other than displaying it. Uh, and even that you cannot do very well because it's not translatable. So the first thing we should do is to wrap it in get text. So even if you only care about one language, it's good to get into the habit of, getting, of using get text. So that way you'll think of using it when you want to handle pluralization. So now the error has a meaning for our user. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So now the error has a meaning for our user, uh, but it still has no meaning for the system. And we'll see why we add, and that's why we add an error code. So thanks to that error code, uh, we can now uh, easily recognize uh, that error when it happens, uh, which performs, uh, which helps to write uh, more robust unit tests, uh, to perform conditional logic, uh, or to easily customize the error message. So uh, we've already seen how field can customize error messages coming from validators, uh, but it also works at the form level. Uh, so, for example, if you're using a, a form from a third-party app, but you don't like the way uh, the author wrote the messages, uh, you can subclass it and specify new error messages. Uh, you can do that uh, very easily and declaratively on a model form, uh, or with a little bit of uh, elbow grease on the regular forms. Another thing you can do uh, to make your error more usable is to not interpolate the value into the message, uh, but instead use the params argument. So Django built the uh, final message using string interpolation with the person sign uh, between the message and the params. So the last recommendation is to use a dictionary for params. That way, the message author uh, can decide whether they want to include uh, that parameter or if they want to leave it out from the final message. And this also enables you to pass around uh, additional data that is not intended for display. So here is an example uh, taken from Django Unique Together Validation. It even includes the model instance uh, that failed to validate. Now, do you really need to do all of that? Well, it depends. Uh, it's a must if you are writing a reusable component, like a third-party app. But if you are at the end of the chain, uh, and you know that all you will ever want to do with that error is to display it in an HTML template, uh, and you're not planning to writing a test for it, uh, then you may skip providing code and params. Uh, but most of the time, you probably shouldn't skip them. All right, now let's talk about forms. The most common and explicit entry point uh, to form validation is the isValid method, which internally will check if the form is bound and then access the errors attribute which happen to be a property. Uh, and that property will check if validation has already run by inspecting the private underscore errors attribute. And if it doesn't, it will trigger the full clean method um, before finally returning the result. Alternatively, you can call full clean yourself, uh, and that will start the, the validation process. So this is a slightly simplified full clean method. The real one has a couple of short circuits uh, if you detect that the validation doesn't need to run. And the first thing to note is that full clean doesn't check if validation has already run. Uh, and it starts by resetting the validation state. So if you're not careful, um, you can run validation twice by accident, which is not so serious. Uh, but the worst case scenario is that you could lose some state. Because if the validation has already run and you modified it externally, for instance, from the view, then that state will be discarded. Once the state is, is set, um, it calls the clean fields method. Uh, 
which iterate through all the fields, grabbing the value from the widget. Speaking of which, if you want, you can implement some validation at the widget level. Then it calls the fields clean method um, that we covered earlier. And then there is one additional uh, check for fields. Um, if there is a method called clean underscore field name, uh, it will call it. And should there be any validation error, it will catch it and pass it to the add error method, uh, which we'll discuss in a minute. But one thing to note is that exceptions are caught within the loop, uh, meaning that an error on a field doesn't abort the validation process, so every field is given a chance to provide feedback. Now it calls the clean form method. Clean form is a wrapper around the forms clean method, which by default doesn't do very much, it's just a stub. But that's a public API that you are expected to uh, overload to under validation that don't belong to one field in particular, or that relies on multiple fields, uh, or that expect validation um, to happen once the field validation process is over. So this method is called even if field validation encountered errors. Uh, and because invalid fields are removed from clean data, uh, you cannot assume that their value is available. So I'm sure you've encountered this before, where you get a key error uh, when trying to fish out a value from clean data. And that's, you should use a get uh, function uh, instead of the bracket notation, and you should handle uh, missing values. And then there is postclean, uh, which by default doesn't do very much, uh, but it's a hook that is used by model form to orchestrate model validation. So now let's talk about the add error method. Um, it was introduced in Django 1.7. Uh, and before, you had to fill directly with underscore errors, uh, which was far from trivial. It takes two arguments, field and error. So when an error represents a single error or a list of errors, uh, the field argument is the name of the field uh, to which they belong. Uh, it's, if the value is none, uh, that will be treated as a non-field error, which are typically errors that you display at the top of the form. When error represents a dict, um, then the field argument is ignored. And actually, we, yeah, I think we have an assertion that uh, blows up if field is anything else than none, if you provide a, a dictionary as an error. So we've seen earlier that the validation, const uh, constructor, va validation error constructor uh, accept just about anything. Um, string, list, dict, uh, even nested validation errors. Uh, so by wrapping the error argument with a validation error, we normalize its input. Then we turn error into a dict, either by getting the internal uh, error dict from the validation error, or by creating a new dictionary uh, with the field name as a key and the uh, error list as value. And then we check if uh, an error class already exists uh, for that field. Error class is a list-like container uh, for errors. So if the field doesn't have one yet, we instantiate a new one. And then we add the errors to, to it. And last but not least, uh, we remove any uh, invalid value from clean data. So prior to Django 1.7, you were expected to do all of that every time you wanted to manually add an error. And to this effect, we had almost 400 words of documentation uh, to explain all the inner working of underscore errors uh, and how to get this process right. But now, underscore error is a private API, and you don't need to worry about any of that. So when we introduced add error, a few people wondered if that replaced the pattern of raising a validation error. And well, there are places like validators uh, where you don't have access to the form instance, so you cannot do that anyway. Uh, but there are places like clean underscore field name methods uh, where you have both options and they work equally well. But I personally prefer to raise a validation error uh, because it's less verbose, and, um, and it's less verbose because you don't need to specify the field. Uh, Django will be able to get it from the context, uh, but it's just a matter of taste. Now, let's take a minute to talk about the classes that uh, make up that underscore errors uh, attribute. First, error dict. Uh, it's a private API 
So the class itself is private, uh, but its methods are public. There is as UL and as text, which are the historical renderer, and as data and as JSON uh, that were added in Django 1.7. So as data lets you retrieve the original uh, instance of validation error, and uh, as error uh, as uh, JSON, uh, which obviously renders them in the JSON format. Error dict maps fields uh, to instances of error list. So let's see what an error list is. It used to be a simple subclass of list uh, that added the add as ul and as text method. And to that list, we uh, added the already interpolated uh, error message. So that meant that as soon as the validation error made it into underscore errors, all the metadata about that error was lost. So in Django 1.7, uh, we refactored it so that it could store the validation error instances in a backwards compatible way. And to do that, we inherited from Python's user list, uh, which is a class that quacks like a list uh, while maintaining its own internal list called data. Uh, and that lets you proxy any access to that internal list. So thanks to a bunch of magic methods, uh, we could expose the interpolated message to the outside world while storing the original validation errors. So now that we still had to inherit from list from, for backwards compatibility, uh, because some people reported that we broke the tests uh, due to failing is instance checks. So I, I don't know why anyone would do that in their test, but apparently some people do. So now, thanks to validation error uh, being around, uh, we were able to implement as JSON, which include the error message and the uh, error code. At first, we also exposed params um, in the resulting JSON, uh, but we decided to remove it for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, we cannot be sure that the values in params are JSON serializable. And then we were worried that people would accidentally expose more uh, info than they were comfortable with. Also, since you can supply your own error list to a form uh, through the error class argument, that's public API, uh, we thought it would be trivial for anyone who needs it uh, to overload gauges on that, that data and, and add it back. Now, thanks to that refactor, we were able to implement the as error function that lets you check whether a given error has happened. And if you don't specify an error code, it will just uh, tell you whether the, form is, uh, the, the, the field is valid or not. So all in all, uh, I'm pretty happy of the outcome of this refactor, but I, I do have some regrets. As data is a bit of a clunky API, um, it would have been a lot better if form.errors simply returned the uh, list of validation errors. But the problem is that for that change to be backwards compatible, uh, a validation error needed to, be uh, needed to automatically interpolate and return the error message uh, when used as a string. But unfortunately, Django had already all the plans for the validation error string dunder method. It renders even a single error as a representation of a list of errors, uh, which in itself is pretty useless. And it would be pretty trivial to fix that, except that when you do it, uh, Django's own test suite has over 50 failing tests. Uh, so it's fair to assume that we would have broken thousands of tests uh, in people's project. Um, so, yeah, I decided to stay away from it for once. <laughs> <laughs> so, Django could have had a nice uh, validation API if people actually used uh, the error code uh, in tests. All right, let's talk about model validation. So, it's very much inspired from form validation uh, to the point that uh, even the release notes say it so. But there are a couple of differences. First, there is no is valid method. So if you want to check if a model is, va is valid, uh, you call the full clean method directly, and then you have to catch validation errors. You can exclude some fields from validations, uh, whereas form validation is all or nothing. And models don't have an internal validation state. Uh, so where forms have an internal errors dictionary, uh, the models full clean consolidate errors in a local variable and raise that at the end. 
where form store validated data into a clean data dictionary, model validation directly manipulates the uh, model instance. So just like form validation, uh, the first step is to validate all the fields with the clean field method, which for some reason is a public API, uh, where the form equivalent is private. Then just like forms, the clean method is called, uh, even if some of the individual fields failed validation. And it's no up by default. Then there is a final step uh, to validate all the unique constraints. Uh, that includes unique, unique together, uh, and all the unique for date. So the date base, you know, unique for date, unique for month, unique for year, unique for year. Uh, speaking of uh, unique for date, uh, it's a prime example of something that you should enforce as a database uh, with a constraint, uh, if you can. So here is a unique for date implemented with a Postgres constraint. Unique for, unique for months is a little bit more work. And if you replace months by year, you get unique for year. So one thing to note is that any field that already failed validation uh, is excluded from uniqueness validation, uh, including all the unique together they play a part in. And that's pretty much it for model validation. So now model form, uh, which is really the glue between the form and the model validation, and all of which is implemented in the post-clean method um, so after all the form validation logic has already run. So the first step is to construct a model instance. Then it builds a list of fields that should be excluded from model validation. This includes fields that are not on the form, so model fields that are not on the form, any field that failed validation, and fields that were declared on the form but are, are either missing from uh, meta.fields or exclude it through meta.exclude. Then it calls a models full clean method uh, with uniqueness validation turned off. Update errors is a wrapper around add error that tries to override any error message coming from the model uh, with those defined at the form level. Uh, so that's yes, yet another place where uh, error code will be useful. Validate unique simply calls the equivalent function on the model uh, and catches its exceptions. That underscore unique, um, underscore validate unique attribute is actually a backwards compatibility artifact uh, which can easily trip you up because it's set to true in the default implementation of modelform.clean, which is the only one that is not no-op. So if you forget to call super uh, when overloading that method, then all your uniqueness validation is gone. And that's it for model validation. So now that we covered the various APIs, uh, can we answer the question, where should you implement validation in your Django project? And my take is that when it comes to validation, uh, the best approach is a layered one. So validate on the front end if you can afford it. Validate in the database uh, for anything mission critical. And in between, uh, you just have to pick your poison, uh, because at least currently there is no perfect solution in Django. So now I'm going to drift away a little bit from the topic of validation, uh, but I think Django REST framework did something right with serializers and the surrounding concepts of parsers and renderers. And I believe we should consider something like this in, in Django core. It improved over, more, of, over Django forms, uh, which always had that weird duality uh, of being both a model-like object that can handle data and a view-like object uh, that can output HTML, but not being particularly great at either task. And it also improved over Django models uh, by not being tied to the database. I often hear people advocating for the concept of fat models, and I completely agree that those are great. But very often, Django models cannot be those fat models uh, for the simple reason that they are tied to a single database table, uh, which is way too limiting. So 
To me, the way a database is modeled is an implementation detail. Whether something requires one table or multiple tables, uh, whether a database is needed at all, uh, those are all implementation details. And I view my Django models uh, just as a Pythonic version of the database. And therefore, I see, something, I see the need for something that sits on top of them to act as a greater model. Of course, for the simple cases, uh, if you already have a Django model, uh, it's possible to generate that greater model from it. Uh, but at any time, you can cut the link and uh, let it have a, a life of its own, independent from a specific database table. And now, once you have that greater model, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's processing data from HTML forms, uh, from an admin interface, from an API, or from a script. Uh, it would finally be in a position uh, to enforce all the validation logic all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. So we've got a whole bunch of questions. Um, I will admit now this is a topic that I'm particularly keen on um, and could probably talk to Loic for about, in fact, have talked to Loic for many, many hours about, so I'll try to not talk too much. Um, let's start off with some sort of detail, detail questions. Um, how can Django kind of improve to deal with some sort of non-trivial validation, you know, situations where this field has to be required if this field is required and... You know, there, are, there are common patterns that, that show up. You know, an example would be you've got a state drop-down and a country drop-down, and the state's got to be in the country that you're cho choosing. Do you think we should have some more generic systems to handle that? I think that would be very, very hard to abstract away. Um, I think the current way right now where you have a clean method that has access to the current validation state is probably enough. All the conditional, you can just write code for it, I think. Um, is there a way to return, or do you think there should be a way to return multiple errors for an individual field? You can do that already. So if you are validating a field and you're raising a validation error that contains a list, they will all apply. Uh, and if you're in the clean underscore field name method and you, you call add error multiple times, uh, they will all apply as well. So the validation errors and the clean methods, they kind of have a bit of a mixed purpose. They do a level of coercion and a level of validation, and sometimes you have to do some coercion to validate it, and sometimes you have to do some validation to coerce it, and sometimes you need a bit of a string of it. Um, do you think that we've got the right design there, or you know, do, could those things be separated out? I mean, you, enforcement of the type and validation? Well, it's, it, sometimes like, you might coerce it to a particular... Yeah. You, know, you, you receive a string and you coerce it to a native Python object, mm. um, but you validate that the string, you can coerce it, and then once you've got that native Python object, like a model instance, for example, mm. you might then check that that model instance is valid for the ones that you... Yeah. For the particular rules you've got. And you can kind of get into a cycle of these where you're flipping between the various places. I think the current design is not bad with uh, two Python to do the coercion and... Yeah, and given also a chance to modify the data, and then validators, I think, work really well, uh, but then shouldn't be allowed to modify the data. So I think that works. Um, maybe having this field.validate in between those two tasks, maybe that's something we could remove. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think coercion and um, validation are two separate concerns. Okay. Uh, slightly brutal question. Is there any reason to use model validation? <laughs> Well, the one reason to use it is that it can apply everywhere if you do the right thing. Uh, I think it's Josh was mentioning the other day that the... It's Josh's question. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, like, I mean, like, he went pretty extreme there. Uh, he implemented his validation in the model fields. So making a custom field, doing the validation there to ensure that there were absolutely no way to opt out of it. And yeah, even migration won't be able to, to bypass that. So it's, yeah, it's pretty efficient. <laughs> I think this is one of those questions because I've asked that question to various members of the core team and got different answers depending on who you speak to. Uh, um, so a couple of questions about sort of mirroring in both directions. So we have this you know, 
with wherever your validation level sits, whether it's in the model or the form, and we'll leave that discussion for now. Um, how do you think there should be more tools for mirroring down to the database to could Django implement like an expression API for check constraints? So we should as soon as we, you know, it's just a matter of doing it now. Um, all the uh, building blocks are already there, so we just have to put it together. Um, but that's also something that you want to, like, the, the, the user has to declare themselves on their model. It's not something that we should try to, to enforce automatically, yeah. Yeah. Um, and sort of in the, going in the opposite direction, do you have any strategies, I and mean, there are some packages that try and do it, to sort of mirror your validation from your Django form to the front end? So we already do some of that, right? By, with HTML output, uh, right. now we added the required attribute. Uh, the, so that's, yeah, we could go all the way and support every single attribute uh, from the HTML5 specs. There might be some backwards and compatibility, uh, backwards compatibility issue there as well. Uh, I know, like, Baptiste was complaining the other day about uh, required that's now enabled by default. So the same would apply to all the other ones. Uh, but yeah, I think we can go a little bit further um, by making it optional, but at least, you know, just having a, a flag to set and then all that model, all, all that front-end validation is enabled by default. I mean, if you want to go really crazy down these ideas, then you start looking at Batavia and importing your custom validator logic and running that on the front end. And yeah, so, all right. That's going a bit mental, maybe. It, I don't think it's mental, but... Um, so, Batavia would allow you to do... Uh, to port your Python code, right? But what I find is that it's not really a matter of languages most of the time. Um, if you're implementing a project in, in Node.js and you also want front-end validation, maybe it's going to be uh, through Angular, you won't be able to reuse that code. You will not write that code the same way. The way you will access data will be different. Uh, so if, if even within the same language you can't really reuse your validation logic, uh, then you know, being able to just transpile your, your Python to JavaScript is not going to help. So it's fine, like if you're, if you're just dealing with an integer, it's fairly straightforward, yeah. but as soon as you've got the coercion logic in place, you need to run that mm, coercion yeah. logic to make the validation mm. work, and you don't have that on the front mm. end, so. And there's also like validation that, that, that you can do at the front end level, uh, like all, all those uh, type enforcement and all of those, but, but you cannot do uniqueness validation on the front end. You, you, you need the back end to talk to the database. Not without quite a lot of work and an Ajax call. Yeah. Um, should we, though, so there are, I'm gonna be careful here. You have a, a history of backwards incompatibilities in Django. You can there say that. There are a number of people who are suggesting that you make some bigger ones. Um, like for, so for example, should full clean on model save be on all the time? Like in your opinion, would no. you want to do okay. that? Um, we need to have a pattern where that full clean method is always called. But to uh, add full clean now to the model uh, is just too late. Um, so yeah, no. Um, and with regards to all of the validation error and error dict and all those kind of things that, you know, yes, it was good, it's gonna break 50 tests in Django's test suite and so on. So this one? Do you think that one's worth making? Yeah, this one in particular, I think it was worth doing it. Uh, it would be worth doing it. Uh, but yeah, at the time, uh, yeah, my, my patch wouldn't have been accepted, I think, if it broke that many tests. So. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> but, but I think now that if you look at the design, this, this as data, that's the result of, of not being able to do that change, is, is really clunky. Um, so if we do, so like, for instance, um, serializers from Django REST framework don't have all this clunkiness. And yeah, and they, they, they have an advantage of having been created in a more data-specific, data-y world rather than a very HTML yep. world. And Django's forms have yep. some sort of warts that came from where it was originally written. Yeah. One issue they had, though, is that validation error didn't have an error code until two weeks ago. So I'm, I'm glad to see that landed. Um, when you're building building your forms um, or building your validation logic, um, are there any ways to sort of avoid your duplication if you're not just using a stock model form to sort of, you know, I've got a form that needs to talk to these models and these fields of this model and this fields of this model, it's all in one form. How can I pull that validation logic, sort of infer that validation logic from the models? So one form, multiple models, and you just have to iterate over them and, uh, and yeah. 
do a, do do a, a query, lot of yeah. internal inspection of the fields? Well, you can just run full clean on them, and it will tell you about any <laughs> validation error due to, to uniqueness violations. Yep. Um, what a, I suppose that works for that sense, but if you don't in, introspect it, then you're not going to get the max and min values and the, the data attributes you're going to write into your form, because you can only run full clean once you've got the data. Um, I think the answer to this question is it's not easy. Um, the, I mean, in, there's a bit of manual work involved, yeah. Yeah, the, the internals of model form that do that for an individual model aren't well exposed. I think they're reasonably well exposed. They're um, certainly not documented. They're not documented, that's, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, they're pretty, uh, how to put it, uh, the argument is documented, right? The argument to the init method is documented, and pretty much every single time, that's just added to self. So, so this is where we then get into almost like creating models on the fly rather than hard coding them. Um, have you got any tips about how to do this, you know, where a certain field is required for, a, you know, I'm an admin, therefore I can see this particular field, I'm not an admin, therefore I can't see it, um, that kind of situation. So that's where I think this uh, concept of a greater model, or basically what uh, DRF does with serializers, by sitting on top of them, gives you this opportunity of having one flavor for admin, one flavor for normal users, for instance. So then you can kind of use subclassing or something to exactly. get various yeah. different variants yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes you actually need to build these a little bit more at runtime. So I guess there's, you can use a type or you can use the init method or... <laughs> I mean... None of these are very nice. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of generating them you know, on the fly. Um, I mean, if you're building an admin, you don't have a choice. Uh, for user code, most of the time, you can get away with just having you know, multiple implementation that are more explicit and uh, just dynamically picking the winner, basically. Cool, so um, we'll wrap up there. I'm going to have some lunch because I'm hungry. Uh, so thank you very much, Larry. Thank you.